Hey everyone, welcome in to Patterns Tell Stories. I'm your host, Klaus, and today we're going to be talking about Cthulhu, Antarctica, and Psychotronics. Uh, with me today, as always, is my co-host, Garrett. How's it going, dude? Pretty good, man. This episode's going to be fucking crazy. <laughs> So, <laughs> so let's get into it, man. I hear, uh, yeah, let's talk about uh, Cthulhu first. Um, why don't you just kind of get into, uh, yeah, what, what you were saying before we came on air? Okay. So, all right. First off, <laughs> I want to I want to preface this by saying this shit is fucking bananas. Okay. I'm not, I don't have Cthulhu posters. I'm not fucking... I'm just telling you what I understand the situation to be. But okay? I think of Cthulhu like it's uh, it's the South Park episode with Cthulhu where he goes and fucking Cartman's oh. like on his back and like <laughs> fucking like, you know, telling him where to go and like destroying yeah. the, the BP oil spill or whatever the fuck that part was. That's funny. But yes. uh, yeah, this is not that. This is um, go. Okay. So, <laughs> so essentially HP Lovecraft, for those who aren't familiar in the early 1900s, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, I believe he was from Massachusetts, and he was a horror writer. And he would write fictional books about this whole fucking world that he made. And part of the world, he and it, they would oftentimes, almost always, like that was his like signature thing, was H.P. Lovecraft books made you leave with like this fucking eerie ass feeling of like really just unsettling situations and stories and uh in hp lovecraft's world that he made he talks about what was here before earth itself or like as earth was created and even uh he calls them the elders or the great old ones i have a quote from uh disneyland of the gods by john keel where he tries to kind of explain what hp lovecraft was getting at he says apparently Particles of energy left over from that explosion first took charge of this mud ball, and they've been in charge ever since. H.P. Lovecraft called them the elders. They have been leading us around by our collective noses for eons. But now, for some reason that is not yet clear, a merging is taking place. The elders are slowly revealing themselves to us. What was once forbidden knowledge is now becoming known to millions." The way this kind of connects into what I was explaining in somehow this crazy ass way is when I was reading about Aleister Crowley back when he was writing these Thelemic books, like the Book of the Law, what ended up being some people call it a religion. I don't know necessarily what I would consider it, but his holy texts, the Thelema, the Book of the Law, like all of that Crowley stuff, a lot of it has like channeling or what came to be through channeling. And one of the sessions where he was channeling, I believe, was in the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And he was channeling what he called Tehuti or Thoth. The thing was, is like Thoth, I don't know what you guys know about Thoth, but like there's a whole bunch of lore around that particular mythological character, right? So that's its own rabbit hole in itself. But essentially in this channeling, he says the word when he's like mumbling, he says the word Tutulu. And I was like, what? The only reason I even know that is because I looked into it when Peter Lavenda wrote a book called The Lovecraft Code. It's a fictional book, but he was talking about how like H.P. Lovecraft would write specific names, dates, and places in these stories he would tell. He noticed that there was a strong correlation between things that Lovecraft was writing and then things that Aleister Crowley was channeling early in the 1900s. Cthulhu is the high priest of the great old ones. That's like what his role is in the H.P. Lovecraft world. Apparently, the area that Cthulhu lived in was called Earlie, and it was like sunken under the sea and like in ruins. And they say that Cthulhu lies dark and dreaming. Apparently, people that would hear the message of Cthulhu would be hearing his call. And they call that the call of Cthulhu. And it slowly like drives people mad. I picked up a book at the bookstore called The Mountains of Madness or At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. And it's a story he wrote about a scientific expedition to Antarctica. Well, first off, before they even see these these creatures, they notice the dogs in their camp are going in, insane. That was a big theme in this book was that the dogs knew before we knew. When they finally like dug these things out of the ground, people were like starting to lose their minds. 
a lot of the things that were in this area of Antarctica didn't make sense to them. Like they, they, the whole book, they just keep talking about how like unsettling it was and how nervous they are and how like ancient this shit seemed. Okay. So what is the Necronomicon? The Necronomicon is a book by HP Lovecraft. They would call it a book of dead names. Essentially the Necronomicon, as I understand it is a grimoire. And it's a fictional grimoire, but it's like something that like... What's a grimoire? A grimoire would be like a... Uh, dude, that's a great fucking question. <laughs> Fuck. So the term grimoire is a general name given to a variety of texts setting out the names of demons and instructions on how to raise them. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so yeah, a grimoire, it, my understanding of the Necronomicon is like Lovecraft made his own fictional book to essentially like stir up the great old ones. That's my right. understanding of what the Necronomicon was. Okay. So like a bunch of nerdy Dungeon and Dragons kids would like get a Necronomicon and they'd like perform whatever paragraph of shit. You know what I'm saying? Like it was a, it was a thing that like edgy kids would do. Edgy kids would have a Necronomicon. It would drive, uh, all the evangelical members of their family and Christians like crazy. It's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what the teens were doing and what the adults believed in. So this is where it gets weird, bro. That's all well and good. But from what I understand, and this is a fictional book. I don't know how true this was. According to the book, The Lovecraft Code by Peter Lavenda, he talks about how two Eastern Orthodox monks in I think the 70s or 80s or so, they were involved in like the biggest book heist of all time. They were like going around from universities and like finding their ways into libraries and like these extensive collections. And they were like illegally trading and selling and like stealing all these ancient texts and maps and like collections of books that were like really important to these institutions. And apparently these guys got nailed, they got arrested. Peter tells a story about how when he was growing up, he knew these guys and that these guys had one particular text that was Greek and apparently a grimoire and apparently called the Necronomicon. And they were like, well, that shit can't be possible because that's a fictional H.P. Lovecraft book. Like, what, what are you even talking about? <laughs> and uh, so I was like, well, what the, I, how can I confirm this? And that's kind of what the Lovecraft code is about is they say that whatever, if there was a real one, they say that like that ties in to like the situation in Iraq and like the ransacking of the Bad Dag Museum. They say that like for whatever reason, if there was a real text floating around in these like black markets, that it made its way into the hands of people, uh, Agents of Saddam Hussein. It's a great book. And it's it, to keep in mind, these are all fiction. And like, if you wanted to buy into these things, just keep in mind, like, you have to go towards <laughs> where the evidence yeah. is. Yeah, these, this is fiction. So like, at the very most, we can just consider it a thought experiment. But the correlation between what Crowley was channeling, the, the pronunciation of Tutulu, which is so close to Cthulhu, there's other stories too. Like there was one where uh, they talk about a reanimated corpse. There's a story. Um, yeah, it's called Herbert West Reanimator. H.P. Lovecraft, while he was writing this book, he was in Key West, Florida. In the like early 1900s, H.P. Lovecraft was in Key West, Florida. And he was there at the same time as this guy named Carl Tanzler who was this German guy who was living in America. Essentially, this guy's wife had died, and this guy, like, dug up the body from its tomb, and he kept the body at his house for, like, seven years. As until, one does. Yeah, uh, yeah he, he, was a, he was a maniac, bro. And he <laughs> was, like, he had all these machines and apparatus hooked up to it uh, until, like, people shut him down in the 1940s. And... So here's that was already weird enough, but like there was a museum in Key West that's dedicated to Carl Tanzler. And I don't know if it still is, but because I know it was like, wait, this, this is but, real. This is not fiction. Carl Tanzler was real. 
Herbert <laughs> Wet, the, he and he was in Key West. There's no evidence that they ever met, apparently, but okay. I, it's on record that Lovecraft was in Key West, Florida at the same time as Tanzler, as these things were going on. And uh, Lovecraft ended up writing Herbert West Reanimator. Do you get what I'm saying? There's like so many parallels yeah. and it's such a specific, bizarre story. It says portions of the original memorial plaque that was commissioned by Tanzler and affixed to Elena Hoyos's mausoleum have been reassembled and are on display at the Martello Gallery, Key West Art and Historical Museum in Key West. And uh, yeah, that's like kind of upsetting that this psycho what? is like being put on display in some museum yeah that's that shit very disturbing very disturbing story yeah that's kind of where but when he talks about the great old ones and he talks about cthulhu or he talks about uh yog Slaroth or whatever the fuck it's called he he's mentioning all of these things that are very difficult to wrap our brains around but like so do all of our favorite myths you know the thing mm. the difference with lovecraft is like in a lot of these myths, the the world is the way it is because it's like set up perfectly for humans. You know what I mean? And in Lovecraft's world, he's like the opposite. He thinks that we're almost like just a byproduct of some weird ass accident. And we're we're much more of a commodity and we're much less important than we think we are, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the daunting part about Lovecraft is like when he writes about uh, the creation of the cosmos and all of these different ideas, he does it in a way that like is very indifferent to humans. Yeah, dude, I hope I explained that like somewhat. Okay. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's real strange when we talk about Lovecraft writing about an ancient past in Antarctica in, in reality, there's a lot of just weirdness around Antarctica. That's when we get into like, what did Admiral Byrd see in Operation High Jump? What the, and they, Bird is mentioned in that Lovecraft story, by the way. Like that's that's, that's something that's real entertaining about the uh, Lovecraft is that he would make it, he'd give it the old college try to try to tie in as much uh, stuff as he could. But by and large, a lot of his stories are just so fucking bizarre and off the wall. But he does mention Bird and Bird. From what I understand, Bird was one of the first guys, if not the first guy, to fly over both poles for one. And then the yeah, other that's that's the yeah. interesting part is is both poles. Um, Fuck yeah. You know, when he says uh I think he, he said it in an interview or um one of some I think it was an Argentinian uh newspaper that that quoted him saying uh Chilean, you know, I it think. Can, yeah, is it Chilean? Uh, I, I said I, I believe can, so. you know, these these this is the quote. Bird announced to me today that it is necessary for the United States to put into effect defensive measures against enemy airmen, which come from the polar regions. The Admiral further explained that he did not have the intention to scare anyone, but the bitter reality is that in case of a new war, the United States would be in a position to be attacked by flyers, which could fly with fantastic speed from one pole to the other. And, um, at the time that article was written, the only the only extensive um, South Pole like exploration that happened was was by Nazi Germany. When he goes when he says pole to pole, um, there's really only only one country that that had actually went and explored, uh, you know, both poles at that point when that article was written. So, yeah, man, it makes you wonder why they they fucking put such a fleet together to to go down there for a scientific uh, expedition quote unquote they had like four thousand troops an aircraft carrier um two seaplane carriers two destroyers uh you know submarine fucking helicopters they basically stationed themselves off the coast of um i think it's called like new schwabi land or something like that and yeah new schwaben land new schwab <laughs> new schwabi land <laughs> 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 yeah, New Schwaben Land. I fucking think it. Um, but uh, something happened. An event went down and it threw off like the whole operation and uh, it was canceled. Like the whole expedition was canceled within 48 hours. Um, so it took like the expedition lasted eight weeks and it was supposed to last like eight, eight months and like no reason was given for the for the cancellation. Um, and then they got back. The operational logs were seized and they're still classified to this day. 
that's all from uh yeah joseph Fer- one of joseph farrell's books um rake of the black sun but it's uh yeah i've been i was reading that today and it's pretty wild and when you think about it it's it's really interesting because um you know this was 1947 and uh we didn't we didn't return to antarctica like until like 12 years later that's what kind of makes it interesting is that this was in 1947 which is like the golden age for ufos or whatever you know what else about. was in 47 too bro discovery of the dead sea scrolls yeah that's I believe crazy that was also and Al, also alistair crowley died in 1947 that's another weird one high jump started late 46 and spilled over into 47 right but even still like you said it's all classified and it's always this air of mystery buzz aldrin that's it buzz aldrin went to antarctica we know that he went to Antarctica and we know that he had like some health emergency and had to be like airlifted out. And it was like really scary. And the internet went crazy and was like speculating like, what the fuck did Buzz Aldrin see? <laughs> Wait, and, what, uh, when did every, this happen? This is a couple years ago. But uh, yeah, Buzz Aldrin, I don't think had fun at all. Apparently that shit was terrifying. And uh, so all the what internet. Happened? Okay. I don't know. First off, I don't know. That's the, that's the, crux of the story i don't know but the speculation there was a rumor that he posted a picture of this like weird pyramid or mountain and he wrote like uh this is evil itself and he like deleted the tweet and then it was like all right so when i tried to look at that i was like all right well how do i confirm that the thing is i could never corroborate that he ever tweeted that and it seems like it could have been baloney but from what Tom DeLong said in Secret Machines and from like what Linda Howe has said in her crazy ass documentary about <laughs> Antarctica, like I can only imagine, bro. I don't I, I truly don't know. Then you have what DeLong said about it, about time and like there being this weird relationship with time. He said, like, imagine everything is opposite because I know I wrote this. It was interesting enough for me to take out a pen and write down what he said. He was asked a question about NASA scientists in Antarctica possibly discovered evidence of a parallel universe that goes backwards. Did you see this story? Oh, yeah, that wasn't and this a fucking news article he would he commented I don't, I, on or something. This was he said this verbally. I so wish I could tell you what I know. <laughs> Dude God, fuck you, Tom. He goes, I so wish I could tell you what I know. I so wish I could tell you what I know about that, and I can't. It's a very big deal, and it's a very big deal to the UFO subject, but I can't get into it. Well, what if it's the physics are opposite, time is opposite, and technological advancement is opposite? Think about that. It's a big deal, and stay on this. Do not think this is just a cool little thing. Stay on it. It's all I got to say. I remember that. God damn. A, they asked him about an article and I found it. I, let me just read the first part of it. Um, okay. This is what it says. In the Antarctic, things happen at a glacial pace. Just ask Peter Gorham. For a month at a time, he and his colleagues would watch a giant balloon carrying an, a collection of antennas float high above the ice scanning over a million square kilometers of the frozen landscape for evidence of high energy particles arriving from space. When the experiment returned to the ground after its first flight, it had nothing to show for itself, bar the odd flash of background noise. It was the same story after the second flight more than a year later. While the balloon was in the sky for the third time, the researchers decided to go over the past data again, particularly those signals dismissed as noise. It was lucky they did. The strange finding was made in 2016. Since then, all sorts of suggestions rooted in known physics have been put forward to account for the perplexing signal, and all have been ruled out. What's left is shocking in its implications. Explaining the signal requires the existence of a topsy-turvy universe created in the same Big Bang as our own and existing in parallel with it. In this mirror world, positive is negative, left is right, and time runs backwards is perhaps the most mind-melting idea ever to have emerged from the Antarctic ice, but it just might be true. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, it's like Tom. Tom. It's like <laughs> fucking Tom DeLong wrote this shit. Like, <laughs> straight up. <laughs> My God, man. What does that even mean? Technology but, is backwards. 
What does that mean? No, time. Time runs backwards. It says in this article. Well, I meant what Tom said. I was uh, like, like just, technological cycle or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you know, positive is negative, left is right. It sounds like anti anti matter kind of thing. Bro, if you even look at the cover, I know there's different covers, but one of the covers of Disneyland of the Gods. If you look at the cut, co- it's one of the most. It's my favorite keel cover ever, by the way. I have to say, but like the cover of it has this hole in the sky, and this thing is like poking its head through. And only its hands are able to be seen by us in the sky. But you, if you look straight into the hole, you can see there's like a whole other world on the other side. And above, underneath that creature looking through the hole, there's a saucer. And underneath mm-hmm. the saucer, there's a pyramid. But this is, this is what Akil is talking about in Disneyland of the God. He goes, one example is the legend of the Watchers. Strange beings from some other place or some other space-time continuum have always been sitting in our skies, silently watching us struggle upward from our caves. In the mountains of Tibet, the ancient Lamas knew all about the Watchers. Occasionally, Westerners would stumble upon them too in that distant and inhospitable land. Nicholas Rorick The artist, explorer, and humanitarian reported seeing gleaming metal discs soaring above the Himalayas in the 1920s. Frank Smythe, the famous mountain climber, observed a pulsating tea kettle hovering nearby as he struggled alone up the face of a mountain in Nepal. Before he saw it, he had the uneasy feeling that something or someone was watching him, benevolently, as if concerned about his safety. In the big UFO years of 1966 to 1968, missionaries on the Himalayan roof of the world wrote letters describing their own encounters with the phantom aircraft. During that same period, a handful of scientists laboring in remote Antarctica were reportedly watching great circular objects soaring over ice fields near the South Pole. The Watchers enjoyed another year of tourism over this cosmic Disneyland in 73 to 75. In 1973 to 1975, popping up almost everywhere at once and then disappearing as suddenly and mysteriously as they had come. From the long history of this phenomenon, we know we haven't seen the last of them. They will be back and a new generation of young people will stand on the Earth's hills and study the night skies expectantly. Whatever keel is talking about or what these texts are talking about it seems like they're all like have their finger on the membrane of something we don't know shit about antarctica bro like that it it drives me nuts like this and so many other subjects gets filled in with baloney because we just have a transparency issue like this is our world what is so secret about antarctica or so disturbing that we don't get to know like why is high jump classified it, it was a scientific Crazy. trip. Do you know what Linda Howe said about Antarctica or what she said is in there? Yes, but I forget. So tell me. <laughs> dude. Okay. I have to, because I, I, dude, it got me, regardless of if that shit is real or not, watching her Antarctica documentary, highly recommend for one, especially if you're a fan of unintentional humor. I think she is the queen of it, and I love it because, like, They're just she, like cats dude, in the she, background, <laughs> dude. Yeah, and like, cat, dude, her cats are so cool and chill, and they'll just be like walking around her as she's explaining the fucking end of the world, basically. And yeah. she's like, okay, so in her, for those who aren't familiar, I don't want to spoil it all, but I'm gonna. So in her Antarctica documentary, <laughs> bro. Because I watched it and like, it made me. Well, dude, it's probably remember, eighty years old now. No, it's not. It was it's made not? within the last. Bro, it was made like four years ago or something. Like it's what? it's one of her most recent things she did. All right, and I'm she sorry, said, Linda. I'm sorry. Yeah, she said that it was too. <laughs> oh, fuck, I don't want to twist her words. From what I understand, she had different sources corroborating each other that's the first point she had like she claimed that she had these like navy seal whistleblowers she called them spartan one and spartan two and that these individuals were on some sort of like rescue mission and they were sent down there to go like retrieve a scientist that was 
down below, she was like right next to Beardmore Glacier. They had to take a ship that had a helicopter. And then they took the helicopter down to Beardmore Glacier. And then in Beardmore Glacier, they went two miles underneath the ice. And in that, they were able to access these giant basalt octagonal structures that she claims were 34 million years old. And her hypothesis was that whatever these scientists were observing with these basalt structures were like so one old as fuck and two they were like old enough to be before human beings and that she kept just saying the the phrase 34 million years old 34 and apparently so the her story is that these scientists you could like touch your hand on this octagon and it would like open automatically to your touch. And when you enter this room, it's no longer the harsh conditions of Antarctica. It's like 68 degrees and just like chilling, like really comfortable. And they said apparently that all along the walls of this basalt structure, that there were these symbols that resembled Mayan and Egyptian hieroglyphics. And uh, that those are the points of the story where I was like, OK, like noted. But having said that, dude, how many people do you think call Linda Howe and just like cross her wires up, bro? Like, that's the thing that makes me so sad about it is like, <laughs> I bet there's so many things that just went over people's head that she said. And then so many things like that are true. You know what I'm saying? That like she gets some frantic phone call and she's like, OK, I'm doing a show tonight. It's going to change the world. And then she does it. And then it's like, don't look up. Like people uh, don't even like give a fuck uh, or the source ends up being bad. And then she looks bad. So yeah, like, that's the worst part, man. 100%. And you did a great, you did a great Linda Moulton Howe impression. Thank way. you. I practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> There's, it was a fun ass documentary. I'll give her that. It was a lot of fun. I wonder if they're like hibernation chambers. That's something that like really freaks me out is the, the idea of hibernation. What if there were, super intelligent cicadas that like came up every like hundred thousand years for like you know oh my bro look at war of the worlds that yeah. shit is like burned into my brain where tom cruise like points at the lightning and he's like he's like they're coming in through the fucking lightning they're riding the lightning and they were like already there and the idea that um i think mac tony's talks about it at least where he talks about how you know, humans are just like so instinctually grossed out by insects and to have them be higher on the food chain than us, it would be like horrifying. Dude, think about a super evolved insect. Yeah. That shit well, is terrifying. Well, an ant can lift it. How much more than its body weight can an ant lift? It's some absurd amount, dude. To scale, <laughs> if there was a big insect and its strength was to scale and its speed was to scale, it would be absolutely terrifying. In my like opinion, man, yeah, yeah. Insects also have this whole relationship with the sonic spectrum oh, and know. the sounds they make. We humans think that like our arguments with each other are so important, but it could be that like the crickets chirping in the morning are far more important to our world yeah. than our, you know what I mean, than our mm -hmm. human discussions. And it's something that we just take for granted. A really interesting thing that I, I think about a lot is um, the term telefactoring. Gary Nolan, I think, first used it in his interview with uh, Lex Friedman. He said it's kind of like a popular science fiction term, putting thoughts, and we kind of talked about it last week with the um, downloads. Uh, it's like putting thoughts into, into someone's head, either through electromagnetic means or maybe some sort of sensory input that would be most fitting for that organism. Something that that's kind of honestly kept me in interested in the subject is a tip slide nine, just because of how fucking insane it is. And just how it's a, you know, it was a literal DOD presentation slide that, you know, they briefed um, higher ups uh, with this stuff. And I'm just going to read it real quick. This, this slide was part of a slideshow that was, it was on Chris Mellon's website. This blogger, Jay, The Mind Sublime is, is the name of his blog. He also has a YouTube channel. It's pretty good too. Um, check it out. But he, he, it's scraped, outstanding. Yes. Yeah, his shit is outstanding. I'm a big fan of his. So he put it on his blog 
it was uh, the slide slideshow presentation from from ATIP. Yeah, so this is a slide that they were briefing um, leadership in the DoD with, and uh, it's titled "DoD Threat Scenario: ATIP Subfocus Areas." Uh, the science exists for an enemy of the United States to manipulate both physical and cognitive environments in order to penetrate U.S. facilities, influence decision makers, and compromise national security. And then it lists out categories of, of these uh, phenomena, it says at the end. But the list is psychotronic weapons, cognitive human interface, or CHI, penetration of solid surfaces, instantaneous sensor disassembly, alteration slash manipulation of biological organisms, anomalies in the space-time construct, and unique cognitive human interface experiences. And then uh, under the title DOD Advantages, it says DOD has been involved in similar experiments in the past. DOD has relationships with renowned subject matter experts, and DOD controls several facilities where activities have been detected. What was considered phenomena is now quantum physics. And that, that's the slide they used to, to brief leadership. Each of these different categories could really be its own episode. <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe we should do that. But uh, for this one, let's just kind of harp on the first one, which is psychotronic weapons. Psychotronic weapons is something that has been kind of in the lore of, um, you know, kind of Stargate. Is it's, I think it's pulled from um, kind of the Russian military lexicon. And it basically means, you know, psychic uh, device. The idea that psychotronic weapons would be at the top of the list for this, um, you know, DOD threat scenario. It's kind of disturbing. It really does make me think about, you know, how Peter Lavenda wrote about, you know, DARPA bringing in Penrose and Hameroff for their, to, to explain to, I guess, an audience at a military convention or, or theory of consciousness. It's especially, you know, when you consider like the bottom of the slide says what was considered phenomena, it's now quantum physics. For those who don't understand, Rod, these aren't just like two bozos that came in and had some fringe theory penrose yeah. is a re well-respected well-respected mathematician no, nobel prize winner right yeah i i don't know if he won but i think he was at least nominated and the guy is like it, richard dawkins talks about him in terms of like when he when he's really talking about brilliant minds and i've heard him like really tip his hat to him and say like he is a, a one of the guys that like really really has He's yeah, Penrose won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020. Damn. So what a beast. And then uh Hammeroff, he's the microtubule guy. He's the anesthesiologist. Yeah. And that's a very interesting combination. Is we have a mathematician and an anesthesiologist talking about consciousness to the Department of Defense. Like that is uh that's heavy. Yeah. And uh and it, even when we talk about even if we backtrack these programs that we were talking about, a lot of this remote viewing and the guys involved cross over into this. I'm sure at a certain point when we're studying how our bodies function, like even when we're breaking down the codons of our DNA is like, it ends up becoming mathematical. You know what I mean? Like we end up becoming yeah. biological robots in a way. And I think that's kind of what psychotronics are implying is that our bodies, even though they are organic and they're human, we are biological robots in a way. And yeah, that totally. the, we, we, our bodies do operate like computers, like quantum computers. And yep. I think that something that Hammeroff and Penrose, if um, again, I'm speculating, I think that they probably had a little bit more of a coherent explanation for why that is, you know, and yep. whatever quantum process is involved, if it is involved with remote viewing or UFOs or, or uh, consciousness whatever, in general. Yeah, yeah. consciousness in general, I think that those guys were probably privy to it and were able to teach it very well. So I wanted to just reiterate, um, under the DOD advantages, it says DOD has been involved in similar experiments in the past. And yeah, so I just wanted to tie this, this slide over to uh, one of Jacques Vallée's statements he made at Archives of the Impossible, um, where he talks about potential fakes when going through these cases. And that is, he, he might be talking about psychotronic weapons, as he, he refers to MKUltra and that kind of thing. I'll just read it. 
Anyone going through the Rice archives in search of information about UFOs should, in my estimation, keep in mind that any cases dated after 1975, and certainly after 1985, must first be analyzed as potential fakes. Not necessarily hoaxes, mind you, but products of classified projects, of which there were hundreds, that played on human expectations of things in the sky in order to hide or simply disguise new experiments with secret platforms. This is true for aircraft prototypes whose capabilities, shapes, and material composition must legitimately remain secret. But it also applies to biological experiments, tests of remote paralysis, special drugs, and psychic manipulation, and projects reminiscent of the old MK Ultra. In such an environment, some canceled projects never really die. So I find that quote to be one of, one of maybe Jacques' like most important <laughs> he's ever made. Um, because he talks about psychic manipulation, remote paralysis, which honestly sounds like straight up uh, possession. So that influence decision makers part is, uh, I think, definitely applicable to what Jacques talking about here. Well, it certainly seems like people that don't understand that it's what exactly is happening to them. You know what I mean? Like, imagine if you do that in a place like Brazil, possession in Brazil is no big deal. I hate to talk like that, but like you, if you get what I'm saying, like their relationship with the spiritual world and uh, being like very religious is like they have a frame of reference that they just write that off as. Oh, it's terrifying. You know? That's so, like, really interesting. Actually, um, imagine in cultures where it's commonplace for them to describe. In America, we don't take religion that seriously, in my opinion. So it's is anybody who says they have any experience socially, you could expect them to immediately feel a great amount of isolation right. and just like. Uh, we don't really have a frame of reference, uh, but in Brazil, I feel like, or any place that I think Brazil is primarily Catholic. I might have to double check that. And I think they're, they're very Catholic. I, I feel like if you're that fervent of a believer, you might think that that's something else than a technology being used on you. And that's something that's like ripe for abuse from the religious people. And it's ripe for abuse from the people with that, potentially advanced technology because well, then it you makes don't you think like people ask why are all the ufo sightings in america because they you know, maybe we're less religious so we interpret it as technology dude fast walker that's that's a book valley wrote a while ago i think he wrote that in the 90s and uh it's a fictional book but yeah, it's fiction uh, right yeah it's fiction and he was talking about if you hear this term fast walker, that could be its own episode in itself. Um, but there's an excerpt in that book where uh, this guy who's like understanding, he's kind of like slowly peeling back the layers of the UFO phenomena onion, like hidden finance, intelligence. It's like agencies. the original secret machines, right? Like uh, A little bit. Yeah, dude. That's a really good comparison, I think. All right. Well, I got it right here. It says... So much has changed, yet so little has changed, corrected Beverly. The CIA Office of Security began contemplating the operational use of hypnosis way back in the 40s. Doesn't that make you wonder? A fellow named Sheffield Edwards formed interrogation teams that used hypnosis. He hired psychiatrists and polygraph experts and trained them. I remember reading Edwards' stuff, said Wilkinson. Whatever happened to him? A decade later, he was handling joint CIA mafia operations. I lost track of him afterwards. I take it the research didn't stop there, Greg said, fascinated. Hell no. Bluebird turned into Artichoke, whose goal was to develop technology to wipe the human mind totally clean. Between 1950 and 1952, responsibility for mind control at CIA went from the Office of Security to the Scientific Intelligence Unit and back to security again. Good luck tracking down the files, Greg, Beverly concluded. Could they do it? I mean, wipe the brain clean, Parker asked. Not very well. They did turn people into vegetables, so to that extent, they were successful. Beverly Bernard chuckled and went on. You might say that the artichoke lived up to its name, and that led to MK Ultra. then in the 70s, Parker insisted. No, no, you have the chronology all wrong. MK Ultra had been approved by Alan Dulles way before that, on April 13th, 1953, to be exact. You've got good memory for figures and dates. Memories can be trained. 
you shouldn't be in this business if you can't remember the key facts. Dulles had exempted the program from all normal CIA financial controls, which was very convenient for the technical services staff. Think of it. No signed contracts to be found by nosy investigators, no written agreements to embarrass the major universities that participated. They signed up, Cornell, McGill in Canada, many others. And I wouldn't simply search under the codename MKUltra if I were you, Wilkinson added helpfully. You should also look at a bunch of others like MK Delta, which governed the use of our chemical and biological warfare products. It was the actual operational arm designed to investigate whether and how it was possible to modify an individual's behavior by covert means. I'll leave it yeah, at man. that, bro. It's gnarly. It's a, yeah, uh, yeah, that is gnarly. That made my heart sink. I, I forget who wrote it, but I remember reading, might have been Joseph Farrell or, uh, or Lavenda or, um, someone like that basically said that, you know, Russia had their own version of paperclip. The scientists they got were mostly the mind mind doctors, like the neuroscientists. And, you know, the ones the U.S. got were mostly the rocket scientists. This is one thing that Thomas Bearden brought up. So this is going to get a little crazy and, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But they're... Yeah, dude, at this point, they've sat through the <laughs> octagons. <laughs> they've sat yeah, through the no. octagons. I think we're good. Well, you haven't heard this yet, so you, you'll see. I just kind of want to preface this by like talking about theories of consciousness. So there's this neuroscientist called Anil Seth, and his theory of consciousness is that it's top down instead of, you know, bottom up, which would be where our sensory uh, inputs take in the information around us. And, um, you know, then that's interpreted by our brain and that informs, you know, our body of how to act in, in 3D space. Um, his idea is more, uh, yeah, top down, which, which basically means we project out what we expect to see. Um, and it, he calls it best guesses. So, you know, our mind projects out like our best guesses of what is out there in our reality, like what our senses will pick up, what comes back in through our, our sensory inputs, we error correct in real time constantly. So he gives this funny little, um, it's, uh, it's this little conversation, I guess, between scientists. And, uh, the question is, why do you, why do people say that it was natural to think that the sun went around the earth rather than the earth turned on its axis? Um, and the answer is, I suppose, because it looked as if the sun went around the earth. And then the next question is, well, what would it have looked like if it had looked as if the earth turned on its axis? Making the point that just because something seems to be a certain way doesn't mean it is, but just because it's another way doesn't make it seem different than, than the original way you thought it was. So he says, as with the solar system, so with perception. I open my eyes and it seems as though there's a real world out there. This is how things seem. Although it may seem as though my senses provide transparent windows into a mind independent reality. And that perception is a process of reading out sensory data What's really going on is, I believe, quite different. Perceptions do not come from the bottom up or the outside in. They come from primarily from the top down or the inside out. What we experience is built from the brain's predictions or quote unquote best guesses about the causes of sensory signals. As with the Copernican revolution, this top down view of perception remains consistent with much of the existing evidence leaving unchanged many aspects of how things seem while at the same time changing everything. This is by no means a wholly new idea. The first glimmers of a top-down theory of perception emerge in ancient Greece with Plato's allegory of the cave. Prisoners changed and facing a blank wall all their lives see only the play of shadows cast by objects passing by a fire behind them, and they give the shadows names because for them, the shadows are what is real. The allegory is that our own conscious perceptions are just like these shadows, indirect reflections of hidden causes that we can never directly encounter. So basically saying, yeah, we project out what we expect and then what we receive back in is error correction that we do to make our next predictions or best guesses that we project out more accurate. So the whole point of, of projecting out our best guesses is to minimize um these errors get the clearest sense of reality that we can by by getting these projections to be the most accurate so would this be something that's like invoked in a person 
Yeah, so this ex- is exclusive to their experience. Like, what would someone in yeah. the room watching someone experiencing something like that? What would that look and feel like? This is what he says: If perception is a controlled hallucination, then equally, hallucination can be thought of as an uncontrolled perception. First, the brain is constantly making predictions about the causes of its sensory signals, predictions which cascade in a top-down direction through the brain's perceptual hierarchies. If you happen to be looking at a coffee cup, your visual cortex will be formulating predictions about the causes of the sensory signals that originate from this coffee cup. Second, sensory signals, which stream into the brain from the bottom up or outside in, Keep these perceptual predictions tied in useful ways to their causes, in this case, a coffee cup. These signals serve as prediction errors, registering the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. By adjusting top-down predictions so as to suppress bottom-up prediction errors, the brain's perceptual best guesses maintain their grip on their causes in the world. In this view, perception happens through the continual process of prediction error minimization. Third and most important is in the controlled hallucination view is the claim that perceptual experience, in this case, the subjective experience of seeing a coffee cup, is determined by the content of the top-down predictions and not by the bottom-up sensory signals. We never experience sensory signals themselves. We only ever experience interpretations of them. So there's a kind of like a loop, right, of consciousness. Um, and so Thomas Bearden's idea is that that loop, there's a time delay. The mind is basically sits sits in only in time. Like the mind itself is not within the 3D space because it's it's consciousness, it's perception. It's not it's not part of our physical reality. It's just observation. Does that make sense? I think it does. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so <laughs> all right, let's get weird. Uh, so he talks about, and this is just huge grain of salt. I just find this story to be absolutely insane. But he talks about this thing called a mind snapper, which is a Russian psychotronic weapon. This is what he says about the mind snapper. And again, take this with a grain of salt. It's just uh, kind of a wild thing to think about. An easy but terrible weapon, the mind snapper, is based on the fact that the flow of time must be fairly smooth for a somewhat fragile mind-body coupling loop to remain intact. You can stand time changes if gradual, but if one jerks the flow of time, that instantly snaps the mind completely from the body. Now, every cell, amoeba, germ, virus has its own little mind part since it is a living thing and hence has a mind coupling loop. All those in the time jerked area are instantly broken. A human body is instantly and totally dead in every cell and every part of every cell. No single nerve cell fires thereafter. No virus or germ or bacteria are left alive. The body falls like a limp rag, covered instantly into something like a slab of beef radiated with cobalt-60 gamma radiation for some time. Only this is instant. The weapon was tested twice in Afghanistan on members of two villages. It was deliberately small, fired from a helicopter and Russian troops then pumped the dead bodies full of bullets. The Afghan freedom fighters thought it was some kind of fast-acting nerve gas and called it smirch gas, meaning wind of death. Note the similarity to the dead cattle in so-called ET cattle mutilations, whose carcasses refused to decay for weeks. So in the same, like, uh, like taking (laughs) taking the previous theory of of the loop, you know, that, that the time delay that you can insert you know, stuff into, you can also just completely sever it. And you know how like time can seem like it goes faster or slower. Um, So that's kind of like a gradual thing. But if you just, you know, snap it, (laughs) snap the time flow, it snaps the mind from the body and everything just since everything has a sort of consciousness, like, you know, even bacteria kind of has to have some sort of life force or be some sort of observer to the universe, like literally everything dies that that's, I guess, entangled with this. So, uh, what do you think about that? I think that's terrifying, bro. Yeah, That's really, that's really terrifying, man. So that was the story I've been waiting to read on this podcast. 
Nice. Let's go. Let's uh, <laughs> mind, mind snapper, bro. Dude, mind Looking snap. Looking crazy. I know it's not the same. The voice of God apparently doesn't. That's like the. <laughs> that's like the nickname of one of these crazy devices. But like, yeah, more yeah. probably real <laughs> as opposed to this. But uh, yeah, dude, the I just like that story. I think it's crazy to think about. Dude, but yeah, go ahead. That's brutal. I know. The voice of God, from what I understand, and my reference here, so when people hear me say this, it's a Wired.com article from 2007 written by Sharon Weinberger. It seems like the United States acquired this type of technology from this Russian guy named Igor Smirnov. And Igor Smirnov, well, at least it talks about how they were attending conferences with with guys named uh, Chris and Janet Morris, former science fiction writers turned Pentagon consultants who are now widely credited as founders of the Pentagon's, quote, non-lethal weapons concept. In an interview last year, Chris Morris recalled being intrigued by Smirnoff, so much so that he accompanied the researcher to his lab and allowed Smirnoff to wire his head up to an electroencephalograph, or EEG, normally used by scientists to measure brain states. Smirnoff peered into Morris's EEG tracings and divined the secrets of his subconscious right down to the intimate details like Morris's dislike of his own first name. The underlying premise of the technology is that terrorists would recognize a scrambled terrorist image like this one without even realizing it and would be betrayed by their subconscious reaction to the picture. I mean, that's not even that crazy. I, I mean, it is crazy, but like I read a paper a few months ago where they're fucking taking EEGs and like running it through AI and fucking like reconstructing your dreams. Oh, it's, God. Yeah, it's fucking nuts. Dude, that means that soon people are going to be able to like buy dreams and shit. Yeah, dude, it's insane. Oh my it's ter- god, it's terrifying. <laughs> but yeah, that article that wasn't. I don't even think that's necessarily what the voice of God was. That was w- the the thing I was saying was like that Smirnoff guy apparently was an inventor, and like we were consulting that dude for a pretty long time and they were contemplating using that technology during the Waco siege, apparently according to this article. And uh, that was like way out of control, dude. And I don't know. The thing is, is like when I hear stories about these types of technologies being used, I really think that like the, and there probably may be sinister times when it's used, but like, I bet you a lot of the time the research is to try to protect against these types of things from being used. So I wonder what kind of like countermeasures. No, you know what I mean? Like knowing that these things yeah. could exist. I wonder what type of countermeasures there are for shit like that's that. Good point. Um, and you, that's th- just you get into the about. whole, uh, you get into the whole breakaway civilization idea. And then you think about Havana syndrome. It's a really good question. What, what kind of, uh, protection we, we could, even possibly have from this like so sorry, fucking tinfoil hats i guess <laughs> like, <laughs> what else you know this is one thing that i feel like it's like the elephant in the room or at least an elephant <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but it definitely seems like it's happening and like uh yeah i don't know and i don't that, i don't yeah, necessarily mean um, the technologies we just talked about or what causes havana yeah in one of his interviews uh, sean cahill was talking about how you know, Congress can handle, you know, UAP right now, but eventually they're going to have to start t- tackling. There's there's a psychotronic aspect to this that they're going to have to deal with, and that's going to be uh, really hard. Yeah, dude. And what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't even want to begin to speculate and like point fingers of who would be using it either, because like that's the dude that that to me is the scariest part of that type of technology is the traceability. Like, how do you even what is the footprint that's signature, left when signature that signature management? Know? Yeah, yeah. So you got anything coming out? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to do a space soon. Okay. Yeah, we'll I think do that. that would, I think that would be tight, and I think people would really like it. And it would be, uh, I'm as crazy as Twitter is, dude. I'm really impressed by like how positive people have been about our fucking show. Yeah, it's and that, that shit is awesome, and it makes people really happy. Makes me really happy, bro. So like, if we could like 
talk to people, maybe do like a Q and A and stuff. That would be pretty tight. So yeah, maybe that's in awesome. the future. Yeah, we're you, thinking dude? of uh, kind of expanding some stuff. Um, I made a Patreon. There's not really anything on it yet. Um, people want to sign up, but uh, we were thinking about putting up some of our, um, I guess, extended versions of these episodes up on there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that ends up on the uh, cutting room floor just because we we have long conversations and <laughs> we go off on some pretty gnarly tangents that sometimes get a little out of control. Um, but I don't know, maybe people would still want to hear that stuff. Uh, yeah. Maybe putting up longer versions or, you know, extra clips that we have left over up, up there. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll see, see how that works out in the next month or so. But uh, um, yeah. And then I don't, I don't think I have a new article out, but yeah, check out tinyclaus.com. And then I, your liberty, liberty burb at dot subsec dot com. I just fucking butchered that, but uh, um, I think people, I think it's in the description of the show, so they'll figure it out. But uh, yeah, we created a new Twitter X account, um, patterns at patterns podcast. If you guys want to follow that, uh, we're gonna put out episodes, and then I put little audiograms out on that every once in a while, just clips of the show in case, yeah. If you want to share it with anyone, that'd be great. And um, yeah, I can't think of anything else uh, unless you got something. I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're good. Sweet. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks for listening. And we'll uh, see you next week. Bye.